2 if you want to turn there. Um, Colossians 2, chapter 2, verses 11 through 23. Um, while you're turning there, I just, with the, with the vote for the, basically it's called the Respect for Marriage, but this Respect for Marriage law, they're having another vote tomorrow. Now, I've spoken to the people at this, our senator, I always forget, it's Loomis, right? Lummis. Lummis. Lummis's office. Um, and they, they believe they are doing what is okay, but they're basing it on the Collins Amendment. First of all, it's not okay because marriage is between a man and a woman, and she has a bunch of verbiage in there. Um, but I was, I was a privilege to be on a conference call through Far Reach, um, the Watchman on the Wall, Family Resource Council, and I was on with Senator Lee from Utah and Roger Severino from the Heritage Foundation and a handful of other people from the states where, this is, where their senators didn't vote for it. And they said if there's any amendment that'll be better, it's the Lee one. They said, they said this thing is bad enough the way it is, but the Collins one, all it does is protect the pastor and the things that go on in the church. But if, if that's the only one, then all of us as citizens would be subject to being sued if you disagree with what, if you just say something that somebody doesn't agree with, they'll be able to take you to court yeah. legally. So it's, 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 not a, it's a horrible thing. But the senator, if you get her talking points, Senator Lummis, um, she touts a whole page of her Christianity and her Christian faith and then a whole bunch of Wyoming stuff. And let me, let me just read you what um, Dave Holland wrote. I think it's the best letter I've read, if anyone has seen it. And Dave Holland has spoken here. I don't know his official title anymore. He's, he's, a, he's been an assistant pastor. He's been a pastor. He's, 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 he's been around. But he says... Honorable Senator Lummis, it is with a heavy heart, yet hopeful heart, that I write in response to your letter regarding to your support of the misnamed Defense of Marriage Act. Your letter contains 33 paragraphs in more than 1,000 words, which reminds me of the scripture that says, when words are many, sin is not absent, but he or she who holds his tongue is wise. While you cite many references to both the United States in Wyoming constitutions, it seems to me that your profuse language obfuscates rather than clarifies the issues to be addressed in this poorly considered legislation. Please permit me to explain the real issues at hand. Marriage is an institution ordained and defined by the creator of us all, and to assume that any man, woman, potentate, king, or senator can redefine what God has put into place reeks of arrogance. Our most basic and original founding document, the Declaration of Independence, refers to truths which are self-evident, first of which holds that all men are created equal. This legislation creates a class of people, the homosexuals and lesbians and others, who are, in words of George Orwell, more equal than others. It creates a special protected class of people. Enforcement of laws is depicted in the iconic statue of justice in which justice is depicted as being blindfolded, example, dealing fairly with all citizens, regardless of class or statutes, is thrown aside in this legislation, abandoning the protection of a just government and ceding enforcement to a ju judicial persecution by private parties against citizens and churches who sincerely hold religious beliefs contrary to this law. While professing your support of our federal constitution, you fail to recognize that the constitution nowhere gives the federal government authority to define or dictate matters concerning marriage. In the absence of such delegated authority, the matter of marriage is exclusively with the states. One of the timeless principles of Wyoming Republican Party is the sanctity of marriage defined as between one man and one woman, and these principles have been introduced and widely supported by the general population of the citizens of Wyoming and are not subject to arbitrary repudiation by one of our elected representatives. And then he just says he humbly requests that she would withdraw her support for the bill, which goes up tomorrow. 
for the clarification. And the best thing would be for her just to withdraw her vote. But somebody said they already voted for cloture, which means that there will be a vote. So we just ask that you keep it in prayer. Contact the senator. Um, keep the pressure on. I know that I spoke with Jonathan Lang from the Wyoming Pastors Network, and he personally knows her pastor, and he was appalled that he heard that she supported this. He was beside himself, and he's been in contact with her and praying for her. So it's, that's, that's a good thing. Now we just ask that, now we just have to pray that the right thing would be done. Don't we live in exciting times? With that, we will turn to Colossians chapter 2. Next week, we start Christmas messages since it's December. And I think the message I'm going to be talking about is we're going to be going over who God is, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and we'll tie it together on Christmas Eve, which, by the way, I think this is the third time this has happened since I've been a pastor here. Christmas Day falls on Sunday. We have Christmas Eve service. When Christmas Day falls on Sunday, we don't have church on Sunday. You say, why don't we have church on Sunday? Because I believe it's a time for family to be together with family traditions. And we have Christmas Eve service. And I know people are like, well, your church, you have to have church on Sunday. We'll have it Saturday night, which we typically don't do. So join us on Christmas Eve service, and we'll, on Sunday, do all your Christmas stuff as, with a family and celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. But Colossians chapter 2, we're talking about cults, remember. Chapter 1 was the truth about Christ. Chapter 2, the truth about cults. And chapter 3 and 4, which we'll get into the new year, the truth about Christians. That's the way Paul usually sets up letter. He lays out the facts, the basics, and then the back half of the letter he said, which is great, this is what you Christians are responsible for. You know, that's the Apostle Paul. He said, I'm going to tell you biblically what we have. I'm going to lay the foundation. And then when we get to the back half of what I'm teaching you, then you have to put it into practice. This is for you. And remember, from they believed, Romans 1.25, they believed not what God desired for them, but additions and subtractions, right? Romans 1.25, we exchanged, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. When you live a lie, you not only damage your soul, but your life and your liberty. We don't realize that. But, but you're doing this damage to yourself. It's this self-harm. And a, any type of religiosity apart from Christ, be it, be it you know, a strict adherent to the Ten Commandments, you know, very legalistic to maybe you know 50 shades of gray whatever that is today you know it's it's a horrible thing and that's where these cults were coming in they're like the bible is great but we have something more for you we have something more for you now these cults these works they deny the deity of christ and they add works those are the two distinction of a cult they deny the salvation and deity of jesus and they say you have to do all these things to get into heaven. It's the Jesus plus crowd. And it, 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 guys, it's a load man, man was never asked to make nor share. Did God ever ask us to do that? He said, it is finished. I will take care of it. And they exploit hope. Guys, and hope is such a huge word, and we see that in this epistle. You see it all over the Bible. And hope is an expectation of a good thing to come. What do people say when, you, when you're without hope, you don't have anything? Because hope, even if it's a small thing, this expectation, and our hope is in Christ. Keep Christ. How do you keep Christ as the head of your life? I have this shared up there again. The Bible is one voice, the voice of God. One purpose, the glory of God. If we remember these things, it helps us so much. One hero, the Son of God, and one mission, the rescue of sinners. And that fullness gives us our completeness in Him. And that's what this is, Colossians, Jesus the Head. Now we're going to be talking about the law a little bit, and we're going to look at ceremonial, civil, 
and um, moral law. But remember what Paul said, and you can turn there in Galatians chapter 3. It's real close. Remember, Colossians, General Electric Power Company in a Bible, GEPC. That's what my friend told me a long time ago. People are probably like, younger people are like, what's General Electric Power Company? Well, that's the way I remember the way Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians in my Bible. So if you want to turn over to Galatians, which is to the left, Paul talks about the law being our tutor. In Galatians 3, 24 and 25, and this helps us with our study because, guys, the law is still good. Are you reading through Psalm 119 right now as you read through the Bible? The law, the statutes, it's all over there. I'm reading it today, and yes, it's, it's, I love the law. You know, Paul, or the writer of um, Psalm 119, you know, I, 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 I am saved by your word and the law. It's The law is good, but we're, we're no longer under it. Guys, here's the thing is, the law isn't removed. We live on top of it. We live through it. Matthew 5, 17, God didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. He came to fulfill it. Through God's love and his justice and his blood and his sacrifice, he puts the love into the law. He puts the reason behind these Ten Commandments. They're just not there for us to obey. They're there for us to obey because he loves us. In Galatians 3, 24, 25, therefore the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Now, it doesn't mean that after faith has come and gone. It's after faith has come. And this word faith we've talked about is pistis in the Greek. And it's a conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things. It's that faith that's, it's putting that substance in the shadow, which Paul talks about as we're going to get there. And we talked about an anchor of your soul in Hebrews 6, 18, 19, that we need this anchor in our soul because it is our life. It is our life as Christians. Faith, this anchor, the law, it's all part of our life. They all come together. The Amplified of, of Galatians 3, 2, 24, 25 is so that the law served to us Jews as our trainer, our guardian, our guide to Christ to lead us until Christ came that we might be justified or declared righteous, put in right standing with God by and through faith. I love that, through faith. But now faith has come. We're no longer under the control and authority of a tutor and a disciplinarian. And that's what false teaching does. It's more of a dis disciplinarian. And, and it has great potential to spread. So today we're going to continue to see the danger that cults bring in the form of legalism and deception. So before we get to these verses, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being a God who cares, who gives us his word. And Lord, teach us Lord, teach us and thank you for the examples that you give us in your word and give us strength and give us the wisdom that we see the deceptions that are presented to us today and, Lord, that we have the ability to walk away from them. And we thank you, Lord, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. You need to take a drink? I've been running through, um, a, you guys know from like a cold from all these things. I'm, Wednesday I woke up, I'm like, I think I have strep throat. So I go to the urgent care and they're like, no, you don't have strep throat. But I tell you what, I've had strep throat. Thursday night, I couldn't even sleep. But they told me, you don't have strep throat. But they gave me medicine at least. So my throat's getting better, but it's still very dry. But now I'm starting to get a head cold. So <laughs> I, I'm like working my way through this progression. Maybe it's COVID for the third time. No, I don't have it. But a cult, remember what a cult is. It's specifically a religious group that denies one or more of the fundamentals of biblical truth. And it, it, they're very sneaky. A cult is a group that teaches doctrine that, if believed, will cause a person to remain unsaved. It'll, it'll keep you from Christ. The Gnostic teachers wanted to introduce some new truths or rules. That's the thing is sometimes people are like, I've got a new thing for you, and they make it a rule, a definite thing. 
for Christian maturity, but Paul condemned them. And remember, and this is so basic, but it's so powerful. You started with Christ, you must continue with Christ. You started with faith, you must continue with faith. This is the only way to make spiritual progress. Start with Christ, continue with Him. You start with faith, continue with faith. That's why it's knowing those definitions, faith, peace, knowing that God exists and He's the ruler and creator of all things. It's recognizing Him for who He is. And Ephesians 2.20, there's no cheap building or structure. What we live upon is not cheap because it said, Paul said, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, all the Old Testament, the old and the new, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Cornerstone. And Jesus said, you will know the truth and not ignore it. You know, he said, you'll know the truth, John 8, 32. Not ignore it. And truth is not or ever was optional. And it's given for a reason in all things. And it's attacked from the beginning and will continue to the end. What, what do people love to attack? This book. This book, the best-selling book in the history of the world. They continue to attack it. Why? Because it's the truth. It's convicting. They don't understand it's not only convicting for the unbeliever, it's convicting to the believer. You know, people say, well, you read your book. It's such a nice book. It's a very convicting book. You know, people, oh, you just you read it because it's so nice. It is a nice book. But it, it's, it's a, I want to say it's a hard book. It's a great book. But it keeps us moving and, and learning and growing that our awareness is crucial and, and not buying into the false is critical. Not only for us, it's for other people. So we're, we're going to draw on some spiritual provisions in the 11 through 15, but we have to remember the false teaching that threatened the Colossian church was made up of several elements. And you can see this today. Eastern mysticism, astrology, philosophy, and Jewish legalism. Don't we see parts of stuff of that today? And it's the latter element, the Jewish legalism, that Paul dealt with in this section of the letter. And apparently the false teachers insisted that their converts submit to circumcision and obey the Old Testament law. You know, they, they, they had to do this. But Gnostic legalism wasn't quite the same as the brand of legalism practiced by the Judaizers, whom Paul refuted in um, the book of Galatians, which is, the book of Galatians is the earliest epistle ever written, and it's, it's Christian liberty. Think of that. It's Galatians, I think, was written in 42 or 43 AD. It's the earliest one of the epistles. And Gnostic, sorry, the Jewish teachers that Paul attacked in Galatians insisted circumcision and obedience to the law were necessary for salvation. So you see these works. It's like, hey, you may be a Christian, but um, you need to be circumcised and obey these things. You know, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this and you have to do this. But the Gnostic legalism said that the Jewish law would help the believers become more spiritual. Have you ever, held, have you ever heard that when you, somebody said, you say, it'll help you be more spiritual? And you're like, what is that? I mean, Tress and I went to Press Start the Arcade the other night. Best $20 I ever spent in my life playing pinball on arcade machines. And we got some tickets just accidentally. We're going to give them to the kids. And I'm like, no, we got to go get something. You know, and we got a squishy Santa stress thing and a finger pinky, pinky frog. <laughs> yeah, that was our winnings. But that's like, hey, I'm going to give you a squishy Santa and a finger pinky frog. It'll make you more spiritual. But as crazy as that seems, people buy into that stuff. You know, and people buy into that stuff because they're like, well, well it, sure, it probably can't hurt me. But guys, it, it's not going to help you and it will hurt you because it takes away from who God is and what you're supposed to do. You know, if they were circumcised, you know, they were saying, Paul was saying, and if you watch your diets and observe the holy days, then you would become part of the spiritual elite of the church. You know, you'll, if you do this, you know, if you tithe more money, you'll become the spiritual church. You know, you, we'll let you sit up front, the book of James, right? The James addresses that. Unfortunately, we have people with similar ideas in the church today, but Paul made it clear that the Christian is not subject to any way to the Old Testament legal system. 
and it can't do them any good spiritually. I've often said this, and I don't know if I have in a while. Guys, if it's a religion, if it's a religion, you're going to learn to hate it. If it's a relationship, you'll learn to love it. And Christianity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. If it's a religion, you'll learn to hate it. And guys, we can make it a religion. You know, we can put self-imposed things in our own lives that we'd learn to hate it. You know, I mean, I mean we should enjoy going to church on Sunday. I mean, I come here every Sunday. You're like, well, you have to. You're right. I don't have to, but I get to. You know, and that's the thing as we look, as, as Christians, as you mature, we look at things that we don't have to do, we get to do. You know, it's like, Lord, I get to do that for you. I get to do that. I, don't, I get to do that. I know sometimes we're like, do I have, in our own flesh, we're like, do I really have to, God? And he's like, yes. And you're like, okay. <laughs> you know, but it, that's the way we are as humans. But Jesus Christ alone is sufficient for our every need. All of God's fullness is in him. And we identify with him because he's the head of the body. And we are members of the body. We know that from Scripture. He's the head, we're the parts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, Paul explained our fourfold identification with Christ. That, that makes it not only unnecessary, but sinful for us to get involved with any kind of legalism. The first one, and we'll go, is that we're circumcised in him, we're alive in him, verses 12 through 13, we're free in law from him. And we're victorious in Him. Now, look at this first chapter 2, verse 11. Why do I say we're all these things in Him? Look at the first two words in this. In Him. Guys, it's all about being in Him, and in Him we do things through Him. We do things through Him. In Him, that's the key. You are also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. It's an internal and spiritual thing. By putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, the Christian commitment is written on the heart, not in the body. We talked about this in Sunday school. We have the authority of Scripture, but if it's just up here, it's nothing. It has to be here. And that's the circumcision of the heart. God has to come in and do a heart surgery in us like Rusty's going through tomorrow. Maybe God does kind of an ablation to us, you know, but, it's, but His work is permanent. It's done by the Holy Spirit. There's nothing we can do physically to bring us to Him. It's this thing. And why do we know this? Jeremiah 31, 33. Remember we talked about the law being a tutor, the prophets, the apostles. Jeremiah 31, 33. But this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, their inward parts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Remember the word covenant. When you see it, it's a contract. It's a, it's a revelation. And on the either side, it's a relationship with God that develops and our responsibility. It's this contract that has three things. A covenant. Anytime you see the word covenant, Think of revelation or the main idea, relationship builder with God and our responsibility. Our responsibility, come to Him, let Him go to work and, and do what He tells us that He wants us to do. His resurrection is our spiritual resurrection and we are alive in Him. Alive in Him, look at verses 12 through 13. We're buried with Him in baptism in which you also were raised with Him. I love that. We're not just left there. You know, we're not... You always like that joke when you're a pastor, I'm going to put you under and wait till the bubbles stop, right? You know, but it's... But people, sometimes they, sometimes when you become a Christian, it's like, you know, it's, it's like... It's the, you would look at somebody and you think it's the worst thing of their lives. You know, buried with them. It's like I drowned with God. You know, He left me there. No, we're raised with Him. We're raised with Him in which you were raised with Him. How? Through Faith. Faith in what? The working of God. Not our working. You can see how Paul is refuting the cults. He says, guys, it's not about you. It's through faith in the working of God 
who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I love that, guys. He's forgiven us all trespasses. The handwriting of requirements that were against us were the legal demands of the law. Guys, this is what was against us. Still is. It'll bring you to Christ. It'll leave you there. The Ten Commandments, great. They bring you right to the cross, and that's where they have to leave you because there's nothing other than that that can get you through the cross. It's in Christ through Him. The law opposed us by its demands for our payment of sin. I mean, it says, because we couldn't do it. It's like you come to it and it's like you can't pay. And, you want, and it's almost like our soul wants to, but we can't. We can't do it on our own. A certificate of death was a common means of tracking indebtedness in the ancient world. It's, it's, if you owed somebody, it was like you, you could spend your life, if you remember, Scrooge is coming up. You know, I, I, um, Scrooge says, I, are they all the poor The places closed? You know, if you owed, you could be thrown in a debtor prison with your family of your debt that you owed. In secular literature, this handwriting was an IOU signed by the debtor. And here it might be paraphrased, a certificate of debt consisting of decrees. Now, this refers, this handwriting, these ordinances, to the Mosaic law which the Jews had contracted to obey and to which Gentiles by conscience were obligated. Our own conscience scream out guilt, don't they? They do. I mean, my daughter, she's 25 now, but I remember as a kid, if she'd do something wrong, I, I didn't even have to ask her. When she grew up a teenager, she kind of got over it, as most teenagers do. But uh, she would eventually just start crying, and you're like, what's happened? I pushed something under the fireplace and I don't know, I was so afraid. And I'm like, well, it was really nothing. You know, but your conscience just got to her. And that's the same with us. We, we can try to deny it, but we can't. Because it, we, it's it, owing to man's inability to fulfill the obligation of obedience. We can't do it on our own. So we're indebted to God through the law. The law, the right and the wrong. We're indebted through it. But through Jesus Christ, this debt was graciously blotted out. He took it away. Now, what about the law? We're going to look at three things of law, which, and some of these, think about as we go through them, how people throw that against you as a Christian. You know, the Old Testament law, well, if you're a Christian, why do you eat pork and all that other stuff? Well, why not? It's good. You know, it's bacon, ham, pork chops. Why? <laughs> I mean, why wouldn't you? I remember our tour guide from Israel, he was a Jewish guy, and, and, and they, you know, we eat bacon, and he's been over in the States. I had breakfast with him, he was over in the States in, in Wisconsin once, and, and we're joking about bacon, and he, he just kind of on the side, he goes, yeah, I've had bacon, it's really good. <laughs> it's just like, of course it is. You know, but it's, here's these things, part of the Jewish law included those laws found in the Old Testament, and when Paul says, that non-Jews, Gentiles, had, are no longer bound by these laws. He's not saying that the Old Testament laws don't apply to us today. He's saying certain types of laws may not apply to us today. In the Old Testament, there were three categories of law. The first one is ceremonial law. And this law relates specifically to Israel's worship. Specifically to their worship. Its primary purpose was to point forward to Jesus. That's where we're going to see the word shadow coming up. It, it points towards him. Therefore, these laws were no longer necessary after Jesus' death and resurrection. They, they didn't have to be followed. And, and while we're no longer bound by ceremonial laws, the principles behind them to worship and love a holy God still apply. So the principle's still there. And Jewish Christians often accuse the Gentiles, Christians, of violating the ceremonial law. You saw that a lot, remember, especially with the meat early on. Now the civil law, this type of law dictated Israel's daily living, which is Deuteronomy 24, 10, and 11. Because modern society and culture are so radically different, some of these guidelines can't be followed specifically 
but the principles behind the command should guide our conduct, the principle behind it. You know, and that has a lot of it to do with hand washing, the eating of certain things. They did them to protect the people from getting diseases. You know, that's what the reason behind it. At times, Paul asked Gentile Christians to follow some of these laws, not because they had to, but to promote unity. You know, that it, if, it's, if it's no big deal, then you, and if you can do it, then just go ahead and do it. You know, like, uh, was it Timothy that got circumcised? There's a sacrifice as an adult, right? But Paul's like, you know, it pro probably would help you if you did it. And Timothy's like, okay, it's no big deal. I'm glad they do that when you're younger. That's all I got to say. Moral law. This is the sort of law is the direct command of God, the Ten Commandments, and it requires strict obedience. Whatever their, in it, um, whatever their level of debt to God following their uh, many trespasses, God has canceled the debt by nailing it to the cross. And I just have written down here just from this morning's reading, Psalm 119, I will keep your commandments, I love your commandments. You know, I, it, where, the, where the writer's like, it's not that he's done away with them. He says, I love them, I'm going to keep them. By your word I have been saved. If you read Psalm 119, it's everywhere. Isn't the law or the statue mentioned in every verse of Psalm 119? Pretty close. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Now we're victorious in him. Verse 15. Oh, verse 14. Uh, did, did I, no. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he has made a public spectacle, spectacle spectacle of them triumphing over them in it now one of these things nailed it to the cross he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross she's got it but um think of this god has taken all of our sins and guys this is so important because we need to take anything we have against anybody else nail it to the cross Nail it to the cross. I, I came up with this, um, this phrase while I was working on this. The law, and we are very good at having this hard hammer of humanity. And we like to take our own set of nails and drive them into other people's sins, don't we? Don't we? Where we can just give them to God, have Him, already what is done, nail them to the cross. And if they're nailed there, we're not going to go back and get them. Or there's not a or it's going to be hard. And I'm not talking about nails because what was Jesus Christ crucified with? Nails or spikes? Spikes. So here's we got to take these things that we have, guys, and, and we need to take these things in our lives, the stuff that we carry around, and just give it to Him. Let Him nail it. It's already said He's done it. And when we do it, what do we do? We're like, we're like a, a hammer and fool. Give me more. I'm going to, oh, that person, I'm going to, yeah, they did that to me. Let me put that up there. I'm going to put that up there. And we start hitting our thumb, hitting our arms. We start hitting everybody. You know, and everybody's like, what kind of Christian is that? Can't use his thumbs? Oh, that's me. You know, you know it looks like he's, he's got black and blue nails. It, guys, it's not the way it was meant to be. That's the way, and he says, that's the way of the cults, though. They make it religion. They're, they give you something. Oh, you got to keep this. Oh, you got to do this you got to do that. And pretty soon you're just tired. You've got all these rules, all these regulations. But we said, just read in verse 15, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing, victorious in him over them in it. And we know from, I think it's 2 Corinthians, that this triumph, 2.14 in the Roman days, was a public spectacle when a Roman general would win a battle and he'd come home, he'd have the general and all the slaves and all the spoils before him triumphing over them, making a public spectacle. God has made a public spectacle all over rules, rule, rulers and authorities, which are here referred to the forces of evil and spiritual realms. So he's already conquered them. He's told us that. He's the fullness, not the angels, because we see now, believe and beware in 1623, how angels come into play. And how would he know that angels are being worshipped? The book of Hebrews, right? God is better than angels. So verse 16, let no one 
judge you in food or drink. We know religious, religious laws, right? Food or drink regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. The substance is of Christ. Think of flashing red signals at a railroad crossing, skull and crossbones on a bottle of rubbing alcohol. Does anybody remember the Mr. Yuck stickers, that big campaign? Mr. Yuck is mean. Mr. Yuck is green. I'm waiting for the older people to finish that for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A, children must be taught to heed warnings. Adult must be reminded not to get accustomed to them. And, and the warnings are a matter of life or death. Sometimes we think, that's ah, no big deal. Guys, it's a matter of life or death. Think, think, if you, think if a cult or some knowledge kept you away from salvation or if you spent your life trying to do something that really didn't matter, a work for God when he's already finished that work. And the spiritual life also has its dangers and warnings. And Moses warned the Israelites to beware of forgetting the Lord once they got into the promised land. That's the whole the book of Deuteronomy is. And the Lord Jesus often used the word believe and beware. I mean, beware. Because in, in this word beware in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it means he, he, beware means to bring near, to turn to, to hold in mind. He says, beware, bring near, turn to, hold in your mind, to pay attention. And actually, it means to be addicted to. I mean, Paul says, give attention to God's word, it means to become addicted to it. You know, it's, it's a good addiction. Hold in your mind, pay attention, he says. But in this section, we'll quickly go through the three warnings for us to heed if we are to enjoy our fullness in Jesus Christ. And the first one is, let no one judge you. Are we to judge as Christians? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It says do not judge, but when you read it through, it means to judge carefully. In Matthew 7, it, when you read it, it means when you're judging somebody, do it as if performing eye surgery on their soul. You know, and do with, judge with a righteous judgment. But here, let no one judge you. The warning exposes the danger of legalism of the Gnostic teachers. The doctrines were a strange mixture, like we said, of a lot of different things. And apparently the Jewish legalism was very important. And, and when you mix these things, the Eastern mysticism, the Jewish legalism, and a, a smattering of philosophy and Christian teaching, there's no substance or sustainability to it. You know, they, they, they just can't, it just doesn't work. And this is what the scholars call the Colossian heresy. It was this mishmash of Jewish pagan religious practices followed to attain spiritual fulfillment. And what, is, what does it involve? Look at verse 18. Let no one cheat you out of your reward. That means no one rob you. Taking delight in false humility and worship of angels introducing into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Self-made religion, fleshly mind. Now, false humility, true humility. This is the center of it. Asceticism. Practices refer to different forms of self-denial which were thought to attract God's favor. Right? Oh, I'm going to deny myself this. And let everybody know about it, right? Because... If we fast and pray, is it okay if you're fasting to let people know why you are? It's okay, but it's better not to. I mean, you can tell people that you're fasting a certain day. That's okay. But you don't want to say, you know, on social media, I'm fasting every day, you know, because you're taking away all your reward for it. And, and it's, it's a false humility. It's almost like you're not doing it for God. You're doing it for you. And everybody's like, you're denying yourself, you know, and that's what this is. Through false humility and the worship of angels. True humility, and guys, this is, the, this is the true meaning of being humble. Being humble is not beating yourself down. Okay? True humility is seeing ourselves as we really are in God's perspective. That's true humility. You know? It, it keeps us humble. Who we are, you know, here's God, here we are. I can only imagine when we sing that song, it makes me cry almost every time. Because really, really, you think about it, what will you do? I think I'm just going to stand there for like, lucky that we're there for an eternity, because probably the first five years I'm just going to stand there. Then I think the next five I'll dance because I can't dance now. 
That's just the way I'm thinking. But um, guys, the person who judges a believer because that believer is not living under Jewish laws is really judging Jesus Christ. Think of that. You know, it's almost as if they're saying, God, what you gave us isn't good enough. I'm not judging them. I'm judging him. And that's a horrible place to be. Because he's the judge. He's the king. He's the lawgiver. They're saying that he didn't finish the work of salvation on the cross and that we need to add something to it, that he's not sufficient for all of our spiritual needs as Christians, that it's just not good enough in him. Now going back to this substance and shadow, verse 17, it said, For these were a shadow of future things, but the substance belongs to Christ. Remember, the tabernacle all pointed to Christ. Exodus, we studied it. The tabernacle and all of its things pointed to Christ. Once that came, done away with. Because now we have the substance. That was all the shadow. It was all the shadow. The Mosaic dietary restrictions and calendar celebrations were a shadow. They were a shadow. They all pointed to Christ of the things to come and that they foreshadow or foretold of the coming spiritual blessings. But the substance of these blessings or these divine benefits themselves come not from the law but from Christ. Think of that. Think of the life of the Apostle Paul. What made him such a powerful evangelist? He was brought up and tutored by Gamaliel. I mean, he was like the best of the Hebrew rabbis. Paul knew all the Old Testament. He lived it. And now he, see, he saw the shadow, and now he's fully living the substance. And, he, and he's living under the conviction of what he did. Not, not the conviction, um, the realization of what he did, because there's no condemnation of those in Christ. Paul himself wrote that, Romans 8.1. But he's, he has the foundation, and he just knows. He knows, guys. He knows, he knows the Old Testament, and he sees the New Testament, and he's just on fire. And that's the way we should be. Should we be Paul's? We can be. We should, we should tell people, because the law is the foundation, but Jesus Christ is the love. I mean, and it's right here. That's why... You know, some people are saying, well, I only read the New Testament because the Old doesn't pertain. <laughs> 90% of the Old, the New is from the Old. But then you might say, well, then I don't have to read it. No, you got to read it. It's great stuff. And every time you pick up something new, every time. I used to not really like the book of Isaiah that much. I really like it a lot more now. I mean, I, it's, it's just growing on me. I really like Jeremiah. Just finished it. Daniel, I mean, you, you read them all and you just see what takes place. And, you, and then when you're reading the New, you just like, oh, you can see what Jesus meant. You can see why Paul, when he's writing this, it really means something to him and the readers, and it should mean something to us so our reward isn't taken. Because look at verses 19, and not holding fast. We're either connected to Christ or not. And not holding fast, remain united to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments grows with increase that is from God. As we mature, we grow with God. Therefore, verse 20, Paul's starting to wrap it up. He's pointing back all the way to verse 14. Remember, when it's a therefore in the Bible, ask yourself what it's there for. It typically summarizes, points back. It'll, it'll, it'll point back. If you died with Christ, He's, 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 he's kind of summing this up, but the transition from the cults to the Christians that's coming. Therefore, if, a choice, right? Do you notice how many times the word if is in the Bible? We get to choose. If you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject or lay down yourselves to regulations? ordinances he's saying if you become a christian why are you doing these things of the world why do you lay down and accept them do not touch and he goes and you know here's the do not like do not touch do not taste do not handle which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men not a god of men question mark 
These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Ah, they look good. In self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. He goes, guys, these things look good, but the soul knows the impossibility and impractability. Is that a word? It is now. <laughs> of of um, how impractic, pra- impractical it is. I, can I say that word? I need a drink of water. How impossible it is. We'll stick with that. There's just certain things our soul knows can't be done, but yet we still try, and the world says we can, but we can't. You know, that tug of war we go back through. You know, is this good for me? Is it not? It looks good. We should do it. You know, it feels good. Remember, pleasure is sin. Um, sin pleasure is good for a season. Short. Mm-hmm. In Satan, if you remember in James chapter 1, the hook, the bait, it's attractive. Don't you think that fish thinks that worm in that lure looks attractive until it bites down? And then he's hooked. It's the same with us. James talks about it. Elements of the world. They come with regulations. They have no value dealing with inner spiritual reality. Isaiah 29, 13, this verse I have up on the board. Isaiah knew it. The Lord said the things of the world. He said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but I've removed their hearts far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. The commands of men. It's foolish to base one's salvation on abstinence from temporary things like food. Because we love food, don't we? How many people just ate a little bit this last week? <laughs> I think we all ate enough and then some. And we excuse it, don't we? It's like, oh, it's Thanksgiving. I'm giving thanks. And it's good food. I don't, we don't need an excuse for that. We have potlucks for that. That's why we only have them once a month, too. But, um, but just wrapping this up, Ephesians 4, if you want to turn there, Ephesians, real close to you. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Paul says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Guys, evil is very prevalent. And there's no such thing as abstract evil. And evil is a terrible force in this world, wrecking lives and capturing people for hell. That's why we need to be aware of the culture. And how you discover what's false is you have to know what's true. And that's why I always encourage people to read their Bible. It talked about false wisdom. Romans 11.33 Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Legalism the law, religion, the bottom line is the false obscures the truth. The false obscures the truth and the deal of the devil is in his deception. It's the shadows. What do you need to cast the shadow? You need light. I remember doing a, a, a service a while ago and, and, the, and the funeral director said, you know, because I quoted Psalm 23 and he said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and he said, you know, in order to have a shadow, you need a light. So he goes, who do you think was walking with him? David, when he wrote that, it's got to be God. You know? So even in those, t- he was walking with him. And, and, and that's it. The deal of the devil is in deception or the shadows. But God is the light, and he brings that substance to everything. Because right at the end, he says, you know, you, know, you are my right hand. You know, you will not depart from me. And the life of the Christian is in Christ. In Him is the key. And the truth about the cults is there's no substance. It's laws and rules. And the only thing that holds it together is this continual another thing. And this crowd. And Jesus and this. But for us, the basis for our freedom is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because in Christ is life. 
in Christ is life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for so how much, how much you care for each and every one of us, Lord. And as we go forth today and every day, let us remember everything is in you, in Christ, Lord. Um, and just give us that strength and that wisdom to go to you, to stay in and with you, Lord. And we just want to thank you for all you do and all you will do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.